So we got Revit in the house here. We got, we got GraphQL. GraphQL is this uh, triangle and the hexagon symbol. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna start a little like, uh, like un, untangle this a little bit, graph databases versus GraphQL, right? And, and we already mentioned that here in the group here. Amit is like, oh, we're using Neo4j, you know, in the house, like we do it for some projects. And then Arif is like, we use GraphQL and we have it hooked up against the SQL backend, right? So, so they're, not, they're not the same, but they have some stuff in common. And, and I got a very, I made these slides like 10 minutes ago. They're, they're like very, very bad, so please forgive me. Um, but I think it's important to point this out. So the difference is, is that GraphQL basically is a traversal API for any API. So any API, so even if it's Revit or like Fab MEP, we're using GraphQL with, with Autodesk fabrication products. If it has an API, you can, you can put a GraphQL endpoint against it, and then it can go out like through, through a local host and a web server and uh, using Marconi, which I'll introduce, you can, you can pump it through the web to remote locations as well. So the, the applicability is quite broad here. Um, as a general thing, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna do any like programming patterns or C-sharp fights here because I'm a, I'm a duct tape and copy paste programmer myself. But from what I understand, GraphQL is strongly typed. In GraphQL, you build a schema, you build types, you, you define types, and, and you get what you get. Routes are basically strongly defined. So the way you can traverse through your data schema is, is only by, you know, it's like if you think about a social graph in LinkedIn, you have like people, and then you have attributes for people, and then they know other people, and they're also people with certain attributes. But you can't, for instance, in a GraphQL schema, you couldn't just build a link from from a person to a car, unless it's actually defined. Whereas in graph databases, graph databases are NoSQL. They've been around for a while. They're super hot right now. Um, and, and basically the data is stored as graphs and we'll talk about that uh, for, for a minute. And in graph databases, you basically have two basic entities. You have nodes and you have edges, points and links. Punkt und Striche. Um, that's a musician joke. Um, and anything goes. You could literally like connect anything against anything. It's, it's very, very uh, loose in that way. Um, but like they say, like no SQL doesn't mean no, no database admin. So you still need to, to know what you're doing. So as an example, for instance, if you take a floor parameter in Revit or for an element, like what floor are you on? If you do that using the Revit API, you, you're basically resolving a SQL joint and a lookup, right? There's, there's a table with all the parameters and there's like the element ID and the parameter ID and then the value and the value is of a type and then you have to go to the table to find out what the type is and that's how you find out that this store is on the fifth floor. It's a, it's a mess of outer joints and lookups. Whereas in a graph database, you would have like, it would link directly to the flow object. Super cool. So all this mess of outer joints is going away. Um, that's I think the differences in a nutshell between like GraphQL and graph databases, what they have in common is the concept of entrance point plus traversal. So if you imagine like a, not a Revit model that is only 500 megabytes large, but let's say a whole like city, right? It's, it's, a, it's a lake of data. If you can pinpoint to a door in a building using whatever query you have, then you could traverse like from the door, which room, what's the neighboring rooms. And you can do that very efficiently without looking into these like vast tables of all the data resolving all the doors and all the rooms, right? So if, you're, if your problem feels a little like, you, you know where you wanna start and you know where you wanna go from there, you're basically looking at a, at, at a graph problem, right? So that's your Stone Age like architecture diagrams, right? From the dining room into the entry, into the kitchen. So the, the rooms in this case would be notes, the red things are doors, right? The, the doors are basically there, they're like, like hyperlinks between, between room entities. Pac-Man is a graph problem. So you have all the stuff when you, can, when, you can, when you can lay out like to get from A to B, what's the shortest route? Um, and then you can, like what's interesting with, with graph databases, you can put attributes on, on the links. You can, you can put weights on the link or distances on the links. Or if you take your navigation system in your car to get from A to B, it's like you can either pick the shortest route or the fastest route. And the fastest route can be augmented with traffic data that says like, don't go this way because traffic jam, right? Um, let's do a quick 
example on that. So this is a, this is a forge floor plan. Um, and, and we have, um, it's Meridian. They have like Bluetooth uh, beacons under the ceiling and they can hook to your phone and over Bluetooth, they can basically provide your location and, uh, and, and routing services. So what they have in here is basically, this is like a graph of, this is your Pac-Man chart of all the routes you could go, right? And, and if you hook that up the right way and let's say you, you're visiting, you go to the men's room and then, and then you have to show up in a conference room. It basically allows you like traverse the chart brute force through the whole thing, find the shortest possible route. And if you're a little nervous and you need to meditate about it, think about it, make some slides, then you can also like take the objectively longest route, which, uh, which takes you like 276 meters through the whole, through the whole thing. Um, graph databases are um, on the next slide. Hmm. They're used in many industries. For, for quite quite a few years very successfully. Um, I think I think it's gonna increase in EECO because it, it just it, it just fits, it just fits, you know. I mean, we're doing more and more stuff with web, we're doing more and more stuff with NoSQL. We all understand that Revit is not the database, the database should be something else, right? Revit is mostly for like spatial, but engineering like solvers and solutions should probably live outside. And if you just Google Revit neo 4 j and Autodesk University, you'll find our good friend, Will Reynolds. He is, um, he is a super nice guy. Uh, he is with Hora Lee in London. He's an MEP engineer. And you should totally go there um, and watch his video. And just because we're all COVID crazy, right? So this is, this is uh, recorded in, that's the year somewhere. Vegas, he's, baby, he's right? Actually, 2018. He's actually done like uh, three or four, so you'll find actually a yeah, couple yeah, of hits. Yeah. He's been back a few years. But this guy is the bomb, right? So he basically, he's got like MEP data from Revit. He puts it into Neo4j and then he does his MEP analytics on it. And, and this is a super, super nice presentation. And it's in a room, people all in a room, hugging and kissing, you know, like, like we haven't done in six <laughs> months. And at the end, get this, at the end, he distributes chocolate. He's got toffees from London and he, he, he gives them out in the audience, right? I mean, you wouldn't take chocolate from a stranger these days. Um, ACO is highly interdisciplinary. And I think this is why, this is why graphs stick in our industry. Like folks want different stuff out of their Revit, right? So this is the traversal thing. What's that? Um, folks want different stuff out of their Revit. So the, the traversal stuff is architects do like room to room egress studies. MEP guys want to traverse ducts, electrical engineers, they want to go like from like, how does the power get from the house through the different uh, distribution and breaker boxes to the different floors and stuff. If you want to do sub metering and if you want to hook that up with IOT data. So these are all basically, they're all graph use cases and they're all really hard to do if you wanted to do it like natively and directly in Revit. Like the, the example I showed, like this guy here, I, I'd have no idea how to do this, how to do this in Revit. You want to make some like some beam elements and and note and then make like a structural beam node network, you know, and use this to traverse. So it's uh yeah. Um if you guys wanna wanna play with this graph databases to get started with, um I think there's a bunch. I think out of like out of the gate, most people are probably gonna do Neo4j, which is a super cool system with love from Sweden. Very successful, privately held, um, super mature, and they're used in, in financial industries, insurance industries. They, they have like node databases with billions of points and edges. Um, they're like, they have insane momentum in the markets and they have their own cipher query language, which is, actually quite intuitive. People have an, have an easy time to get into this. Um, they have a desktop version for their stuff, which is free. So you get like an endpoint, you have .NET SDKs, you have JavaScript SDKs, you can install on your laptop and you can just like go nuts with this thing for free basically. Um, it gets a little pricey once you put it on service, but any database kind of gets a little pricey once you put it on a server. It has a, it has a framework thing where you can actually build Electron apps 
like on top of it, so you can extend your UI. So you could imagine like building like 3D viewers using 3JS, and you could put a forge thing, and you could put it like put it on top of, of Neo4j, for instance. Cypher is dope, as I said. And then the other one is Apache Tinkerpop, home of Gremlin. Gremlin is their query language. I think, to me personally, Tinkerpop was a little, like Gremlin was a bit, bit steeper learning curve. It's more academic. Some of the query use cases are like more complex, more advanced. Like there's some, some really, really smart guys in this space. I mean, those, those like you have, like uh, cross products, you know, and when stuff blows up because you're asking, like you make very simple queries and sometimes they just like, just blow out of the water because they become like way too complex very quickly. Um, Tinkerpop is open source, it's standardized, um, it's implemented in lots of cloud offerings. Uh, and then I've, I've learned about it uh, using it in Azure Cosmos DB. So you can spin up your Cosmos DB, uh, you can do this uh, like usage base now, it's actually very affordable that way or you get like, your first uh, Cosmos DB can be can be free, and you can you can basically write uh, Gremlin queries against that. All right, let's take a look at this. So what I got, so I started working at Microdesk in the spring, and and I had like uh, come out of uh, a previous company called Energy Metrics where we were working with this thing called the Pi system, which is a real time, like it's a time series database. And there I had implemented a GraphQL endpoint against the time series databases where you have like, you have your Pi system, you have a name, then you have elements. Let's see, we have customers and then attributes by name. And then you have elements and children elements and children children elements. And then eventually you have like attributes, which is like a data out of like electrical equipment, which is measured in KW and KWH, right? And, and we built that because what we had originally, this system has a RESTful endpoint, it has a RESTful API, and every one of these lines almost would be a separate call. Like you wanted to make this like, this, this quick little query, you'd have to make like 20 individual calls, right? And, and you know over the web, if you're too much chit chat, you know that that slows things down. So we, we, we implemented this as a, as a GraphQL endpoint against, against the Pi system. So it's, it's very similar to what, to what uh, Arif mentioned, like the, the back could be anything, could be SQL database, can be time series database, can be SharePoint. You can put a GraphQL endpoint on SharePoint. Yeah, I can actually share our uh, GraphQL implementation at the end in a quick cool. 30 seconds of uh, what our structure looks like. It's quite getting quite large of all the building MEP systems. Ah, okay. That's like going back to like, why is, why is, why is Graph and NoSQL nice? I personally feel that it's easy to extend, right? We, we have all these use cases which are all over the place. You just need to bolt on, bolt on, bolt on, and you bolt on SQL, and then your database admin freaks out because they have to like do all these weird things, you know? Whereas in, in NoSQL, you just add it to the pie and, and, and everybody's kind of happy, maybe. Um, so I, I, I had done that before, before Microdesk, and then in Microdesk, I hadn't done Revit in a while, so I was like, oh, we have to, we have to build this thing for we have to build this thing for, for Revit as well. And it, it proved to be quite, quite, quite nice actually. So let's see if we can find this. So there is a, a GitHub repository, right? And, um, and it basically has all the stuff in it to, to get started with this. It's got, um, it's got two, two different plugins. It has uh, a straight up like GraphQL command and it has a Marconi command. And, um, and I, I detangled it a little bit not to overload and then put everything just into, into one solution. So there's, there's a few, right? Um, we can take a look at that. So number one, this is basically the, the entrance and um, and then the first thing we did is, is basically put in, put in a web server, right? And that's something that like a lot of people are like, you can't do it, you can't accept, uh, like you, you can't access Revit from the outside, but it's actually not, not all that hard because if you, if you look at, um, let me get my Visual Studio going here. If you take like, like modern .NET Core stuff to, to 
to to make a to make a web server is actually is actually not not all that difficult and you can host it as a plugin from from within within Revit. Um, so this looks a little like like this. There's the web server. You have a port, and uh, when we start this, you basically do this like we just like do an Owen web application implementing a startup class, which is like stolen from the internet, of course. I don't write this stuff myself. There is a, a link to, to the how-to here. And, and that's, that's all you have, right? And once this web server is running, you can make your normal um, .NET controllers, right? That's your, like, I have an about controller here. And um, let's just uh, explain the doc right quick. And then I have a, a GraphQL endpoint. So when we, when we start the web server, I'm basically passing in the Revit document and the UI document. So that's, that's basically how, how we get access to the, to the Revit API from, from when, when calls arrive on those controllers. And the other thing I'm using is, um, you know, with, with Revit API, you have issues with like sessions and transactions, and then it yells at you because you're on the wrong thread, you know, stuff like that. So this guy, the white shark, he's, he's made this Revit task, which is actually super nice. Um, it allows you to, to basically make almost like uh, asynchronous, like uh, request and await calls against your Revit API. And that way it'll, it'll wait and it, it, won't, it won't give you these like thread issues, right? So if we, if we run this, This is an old lesson, right? Like, don't start Revit in a demo. Gregor. Um, yes. What was the, what was the white, white shark Revit task? Oh, yes. We still I, um, that a little bit for us there. I wanted to, um, I wanted to get silly stuff like a schedule, right? And it wouldn't let me. It, it's like, oh, you're in the wrong, you're in the front end thread, but you have to be in the back end thread. And I was like, oh no, get away with threads, you know? And there's like all these super nerdy implementations, and this guy basically made this like Revit task thing, and you 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 start a Revit task, you hand it over, and then and then you can just basically do a uh, like an asynchronous await statement. So in my resolver, for instance, let's see, we take a schedule. And, and is it uh, like a package that you can pull in, or is this an implementation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's, okay. a, it's a it's a it's a nougat package. Yeah, the view schedules, right? So the view schedules is like you you, you go in there. You you get you get your table data, right? And then and then you can't just do that because of this thread bullshit stuff, right? Whereas what this what this um, what this uh, this Revit task allows you to do is basically like you can you can run this Revit task and you can specify what your result is, and then you can you can do this arrow function and this thing will basically execute it against the Revit API, put it in a queue whenever the Revit API has a split second for you, it'll 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 compute your task right and then and then give 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 whatever you specified as data, um give that back. Um, so this guy. Is uh, I think it's called White Shark, like some some Russian dude. Yeah, I think I found it. I put the link in the chat. Right, White Shark with a Q at the end. Hmm. Pretty cool. Yeah, that guy. And um, Jeremy actually had. Uh, yeah, he 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 blocked on that and. Uh, <laughs> And then there was another, it was a girl from Korea and she also had a, like an asynchronous, like a uh, like weight pattern and hers was way more complicated and probably also better. You know, if you talk to like some real C-sharp ninjas, they would probably take hers, but I think this guy like really nailed it. It's like super simple. 
um, there, there, yes, you, 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 you run, you know, arrow function, boom, return, and, and you're done. Nobody gets hurt. Super nice. Sweet. Um, yeah, it just it removes the boilerplate around run, running the external event. You just expose yes. the lam lambda for it. So that's really nice. Thanks for right. sharing that. Yeah. No, no, it actually like totally saved my day back then because I was like looking at these like, how do you resolve this? And you have to like make the event and a callback function and hand this all through. And it's like, no, no, no. This Revit task is awesome. So, um, so you get this, right? You run this. And then I think, um, I think we may be having ourselves um, this local endpoint, right? So if we go to localhost 9000 API about, we're maybe, we're resolving this and and this is basically it's it's the name of the of the project that is currently open so this is this is basically returned by using the this this stock here is that sets a revit api right so you could basically take this thing and go to town you can add like 50 controllers and you can resolve like architectural stuff mep stuff what have you you can make calls against your revit api and you could have a restful endpoint right and it's super useful because it's just on localhost 9000. So unless you have this thing running on your VPN and you keep it open, it's, it's, it's not quite the, the same thing as putting a RESTful endpoint on Azure and everybody can use it, right? Um, the other thing we have is we have uh, this GraphQL controller. And I'll just like show it right quick. Uh, And that guy also, that guy also knows how to get the name of the Revit project, right? What's neat was, um, I assume the, this, like you, you guys exposure to graph databases and GraphQL is like limited. Anything from like, no clue, never heard of it before to like, oh, we're doing this every day. So we go, we go a little slow here. A super nice tool to use to consume GraphQL endpoints is called GraphQL. And it's this Electron app, right? It's it's like uh, it's, it's basically like a like a Chrome a Chrome thing. And it has your query on the left, the response in the middle, and then what's super nice, it has the documentation basically of your schema is built in, right? So you have queries, and then you can have mutations. Queries are just like getting data, right? So hello returns a string. Uh, we can do family categories, and family categories return return like uh, like an array of, of family categories. And a family category itself is an object that is defined as like ID, name, and then you can get family. So let's do that. Um, the other thing that this thing does, see here, it, it auto-completes for you. So you can um, control space, I think, no? Ah, tap, like, like, um, concludes it for you. Control space gives you, like, the list of all the stuff that's available. And then control enter, like, like, makes the call, right? And this, so this is, um, the execution of this is basically as fast as just, just straight against the Rabbit API. I don't, I don't know where there would be any slowdown, right? I mean, you have a, a little bit of network traffic, but other than that, this stuff is actually really fast. Um, the other thing you can do here, okay, let first. You see how, so this is the families here, and families have, uh, I don't know, name, right? So now we get, we get your, fam, uh, your, your categories and, and right. then your individual families, right? So what you put in is GraphQL. GraphQL is its own query language syntax sort of a thing. And what you get back is, is clean JSON, right? So you can you can take this and you can put it in your you can put it in your JSON editor. So this is like, as I say, you go to a hackathon, you give this to the kids, you know, the high school guys, they can basically start using this right out of the gate without ever having used the, the Revit API or they can be snobs and never used C sharp before, they can do Python or JavaScript, what have you. Um, so that's basically how you can traverse, right? Another thing you can do here is you can do, um, you, can, you can put other, other like route parameters almost. You can put in other attributes, right? You can say like, okay, I wanna have a name filter. 
and the name filter is I'm probably going to mess this up. I haven't done this in a while. Um, what it wants is an array of strings, right? And then and then it only 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 fetches the curtain panels. So if you um, if you go in here and let's say you do the family instances as well. Oh, do you notice this here? There is a if you have a family, the family knows what what the individual symbols and instances are, right? So you can you can you can almost make circular references, right? You can you can go go both ways. Depends on how you build the schema. Um, see that. So now we're getting to, to the juicy stuff here. So once you have your, your individual family instances, of course, what we want to get our hands on is parameters, right? Parameters is uh, like name, value, if it's modifiable or not. And so, so this, this is a very basic query if you look at it. It gives you like all your stuff. But if you, if you weren't to filter the stuff down to curtain panels, you can see how this can, can, can become a very big data set very quickly against the real Revit model. So that's called overfetching. So overfetching is super simple in GraphQL. So if your queries time out or the internet blows up, you know, then chances are you're asking for too much. You, you, can, you can like, uh, I mean, or, or if you probably, you probably have that, like the, the GraphQL response is like, you return like, 200,000 rows of JSON, like that's, that's normal. That's, a, that's, a, that's breakfast. Yeah, you typically want to build in a uh, concept called pagination. Uh, so you typically say, hey, I want only reser uh, resolve 200 results when you have a very yeah. large query. So you can uh, essentially tell your graph how, how you want to limit it because you can have N plus one problems with uh, yeah. relationships. So it's, it, it's meant to solve, um, you know, not um, with a rest endpoint, you essentially have an endpoint that you expose and has all of the parameters that come with it. Uh, Facebook actually invented GraphQL in like 2012 to essentially solve the problem of over and under fetching. It was a primary right. purpose for it. And you only get the data that you want. Uh, and so if you imagine yes, pages in point. the web, in the web, you have a view tied to the data, and this allows you essentially the, the developers that are working to get the data that they want. All right, so Arif, Arif knows how to pick a bar fight. Um, you go to the internet and you put in the paging for GraphQL, and it's actually a very uh, controversial topic because this pagination only works if your data is in an ordered, sorted form. Like to, to want the first hundred results, I wouldn't tr trust Revit in a second to only give me the first hundred doors because you make this call again the next day, the first hundred doors might be different doors, you know, because you don't know how it's sorted on the inside. Yeah, so the yeah. pagination only works if you, if you set it up the right way. So the better way to do it, I think, I think you shouldn't even try to do pagination. I think the better way to do it is to just, just know what you're doing. Stop. Like it, I think it's better to tell the user like, look, that's a stupid query. It's too big. I think that's a better way to go about this than to, than to start to like, Pagination is something from the SQL land, I don't agree. All right, uh, the other thing he mentioned, yes. Uh, so, so we had that, uh, it only fetches what you search for, right? And that is something, um, yeah, see, are we gonna spend the next 10 minutes on, on, on going through this? I think if you guys wanna look into that, you should do a hello world with GraphQL. Um, basically what you have in the, Git, in the Git repository is the Revit GraphQL schema, which has this thing. It's stupid text and I kind of hate it and it's kind of gotten a little big and it's not even sorted by alphabet. Um, and there are smarter ways to do this, but in a nutshell, most GraphQL endpoints will have this schema, right? Where you define like what's the fabrication part, what are the different attributes you have? And then also if you have like say parameters, the result can be other object types, right? And then you can, you can define the routes right like this. So this is how I'm doing these name filters, right? So the, the parameters you have, you could, you could provide a name filter and the name filter wants an array of strings, you could do a single string. So that's, that's how that works. And then a little further down, in any schema, you would define your entrant points, which are, which are queries, right? So let's say there's a query for, we did the, the family categories and it, it accepts a name filter and it returns an array of family categories, right? Um, these guys are mapped against, there is a model with all these guys. So my family categories here, 
very harmless C-sharp class like this. Um, so this stuff is typed out in C-sharp. Um, the stuff I'm using to, to do this is like .NET GraphQL or whatever it's called. There's like some Sharkalati thing, which is also GraphQL for .NET thing, but I think, I think this guy is winning. Um, so it's... Uh, This guy, McBride, and he just rolled 3.0, huge release. Um, yep. So you have those guys. Um, the queries are, so that's a model. I don't think this doesn't even have anything in there. Um, and the queries are defined in, in, in what I have here, a different, a different uh, solution for, for the resolver. So resol the resolver has, the, the query set that, that we allow and where we basically go to, to, to resolve them, right? So if we take your family category, right? So that's how that's mapped. Um, so you have your, your family category and when you go in here, you basically go like, okay, we're gonna crawl through the object list is here. There's your filtered element collection, right? So that, that's a Revit API talk, right? Where we get stuff, where we crawl through stuff, and then if it if it matches the name filter, we go in and we actually like like make this family category, you know, based on that Revit category. But right here, you see, if it doesn't, if it's if it's name filtered down, we're not touching the the stuff that doesn't match the filter, right? So where we're only resolving what it's asked for. So you're not making like these stressful calls where you get like all this data, but you really only wanted the names of your girlfriends or something like that. It's like you you only you only get what you ask for, right? So that makes it actually very efficient. So that is, that's that. Um, mutations, that's queries. Mutations work a little differently. In mutations, you basically can provide update parameters and then you can change stuff. And I provided that for, for parameters, right? So you can, you can put in like um, an update parameter. So you basically say like, this is my family instance ID, that's a parameter ID and that's a new value. And then it'll go in there and change that. So you can, you can you can mess with Revit like both ways, right? You can get data out and you can also push data back. And we're still just talking about localhost 9000, very lonely. So let's take the last five, fuck five. All right, let's take the last few minutes and do Marconi. Um, this thing is, so, so I have basically um, the, the GraphQL resolver independent from the schema because this is the resolver the way it sits in Revit. And then I have, another resolver, which sits in, in, a, in a web page, right? So I have this, this Revit web app, which also, which also has a GraphQL controller that uses the same stuff, but there it's, it's implemented differently. And I can show that uh, a little bit like, um, let's go there. This guy here, right? I think this is linked in the document someplace. Um, it's a it's a .NET Core. It's a Blazor web app um, where you basically log in. All right, let's do this. Let's close this uh, local endpoint and instead do the Marconi thing. Very similar. This one has a little bit of um, this thing has a little bit of web API stuff to it. So when you when you do the sign in, you get a you get a you get a prompt on a browser, and you can just use your Google ID. I like that the best. And then you get a very like stupid like oh it's complete. You can now close this. And the reason for that is because you could provide you could provide this the sign in prompt like inside Revit using like a localized browser. But but for like if you want to use Google authentication, they don't let you do that anymore because they don't like the whole hidden iframe authentication shit anymore. So that, that's why you always have to browse to a page, use a login there, and then do return URLs, right? So that's, that's why that is. Um, so the way that works is, and I have, a, I have a slide for that, and we'll do that in a second. You get a, you get a Marconi number, which is a queue and service bus. This stuff sits in, in Azure. And, and you put that in here, and it doesn't work. Oh, it does work, but eventually you need to log in, I think.
And that basically lets you make the same calls from, from the web, right? So this is on my sheets. That's the schedule. That's data and a schedule almost in real time. Uh, and, and that's why the, the GraphQL resolver is, is, is basically decoupled. We have the same, like if you look down here, we have the same graph, GraphQL basically in this web page where you would put, uh, you put your, your, your number down here where you can go, same thing, right? You can do your hello. You get back Guglielmo Marconi. We get to that in a second. And you have the same schema. So I'm reusing the same schema, right? So you can either do the schema like testing on a local host or you can do it remote from the web, right? And that's basically how we can also here, like you can do your, your family categories, the same stuff we've done earlier, right? And it's, it's, it's quite fast actually. Um, so we're, we're serializing, we're serializing the, the, the request, put it in a message, put it in a service bus, receive it on the Revit side, answer the message, put it back. And that's, that's how the data ends up here. And um, very uh, quickly, so the way we would uh, go about doing these um, parameter updates, for instance. Do this one more time. And, and for now, you're not storing that anywhere. It's just kind of like an event bus and the message is just delivered and then yes. quits out. Yes, yeah. yes, very important. There, there's like on the web, there's zero footprint. We're not taking the Revit model and buffering it into the web or something like that. We're not doing that. Um, we're, we're, we're solely facilitating the transport of requests and, and, and responses, right? So what we can do is this is, uh, let's see here, we can go to our first floor. And uh, you guys know the Aussie BIM guru, right? Uh, he's got these open closed doors, right? So he's got these fantastic doors where you can put in like the, the swing angle and then the door opens and closes. So what we can do with this is we can select this. Um, there, is an, there, there is an endpoint in the GraphQL engine for, for getting the selection and dealing with the selection. So this is like, we just like locked onto this, the current selection. And uh, see if we can do this. Ah. Right, and then we can like, you know, can open the door and we can close the door. So um, it's an it's, it's extremely silly demo, but you get the idea, right? So basically, we can basically have like Revit models with like MEP serial numbers and whatnot, you know, and we can have a guy with a phone go in a, in a shop someplace and just, just eat the serial numbers and pump them straight into the Revit models using, using parameter updates. Oh, more slides. Let's go back to this because I think. So we have a, we have a command, we have a self-hosted server and we have a GraphQL resolver and you can, you can totally extend that. Uh, it's, it's on GitHub. It kind of depends on where you want to take this, right? My goal is obviously not to just like take the whole Revit API and make it available as GraphQL because that's, that's like a year undertaking and I got no team and no funding. Um, Guglielmo Marconi is an Italian guy. He invented the telephone. There is a Marconi beach on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, which is where they had like, you know, towers a hundred years ago and they did like telegraph messages with the King of England back then. So, I, I like I like my my thing to compare like this is like a telephone for Revit, right? Uh, one thing that we have, and it's unfortunate for our industry, right? Uh, API legacies is a programming interface for an application like Revit. Whereas now you go to a conference and you talk with geeks and whatnot, you have bar fights, and, and an API is always a programming interface for a web application, right? And and Autodesk is kind of like very, very slowly coming around to that. So so Marconi is a web application hosted in Azure that allows direct interoperability with a local Revit session over the web. And by the way, you, you go and you hang up and then this thing doesn't work anymore, right? So it's, it's, very, it's very intimate, you should share the number, you work with another person or two or three other persons, but you don't have this thing sitting on a server and on all night. You could, but I don't think that's, that's not the use case as, as I envision it. Um, first version was completely without authentication. Um, so you have your, your Revit thing, you have the, the add-in. Um, where's step one? Hmm? Oh, yeah, let's say from the web, uh, you make a request, goes in a service bus, goes in a queue, gets received by Revit, gets answered, gets put back, and that's how the data goes around, right? The problem there was that 
the clients basically they, they not only read and write messages but they also create and destroy queues so i felt that was a little too powerful to just put in a in a in like a client application right so the way the way we dealt with this is we we added a web api that requires like proper b2c authentication and now you basically you start in revit and you ask the you ask the web API like, hey, could I please, could I please have a queue in service bus? So the client doesn't create the queue anymore. This is like offshore now to a more secure location. Um, so you make a queue and then you sign on from the web, you make your question, you answer your question, you get the result back and then you kill the queue, right? So this is like, it's, it's a little better now. Um, the other thing we have uh, like keys and stuff, the way that is, that is authenticated, you, you basically get the, the key for, for, for service bus to, to be able to chit chat on a queue from the web API. And the other thing you probably want to think about is we're using uh, like key vault to, to be able to rotate the secrets, right? Because you don't want to put like secrets to your, to your Azure endpoints into, into your code base and stuff, because then you can't, you can't change them. You can't update them. It's, it's a very hazardous thing. Um, I think that's my last slide. So we're four minutes over. It's not so bad. Shannon is not killing us yet. Um, GraphQL versus Marconi. No, GraphQL and Marconi versus Dynamo. I think it's, it's a little like when Ian started Dynamo like 10 years ago and he was like, oh, this is, this is like, this is the stuff. We can have notes and we can make graphs. By the way, Dynamos are graphs and grasshoppers, right? And then like no love, nobody, nobody helped him to build his stuff. He had it open source, he had it on GitHub and eventually four years later out of like, okay, let's do this, right? And now Dynamo is fantastic. It's like so much stuff you can do with Dynamo um, because it basically like small, like start small, but can extend to cover the complete Revit API, right? So one use case at a time, that's my approach here. Both GraphQL and Dynamo allow interactive and iterative exploration, right? What is nice with Dynamo is like you can click around and and, and, and build and try and build more and try more. And you always kind of know that you're doing something right because there's a lot of like positive feedback as you make your use cases more complex. And I think that's very important and you have that with GraphQL as well. Um, GraphQL is good for data extraction, I think, and parameter updating. It's completely agnostic to the tooling. Like you can do it like over the web, right? You can do your JavaScript or Python, what have you. And, um, and at the same time, it also lowers the entrance barrier getting in and out of Revit API by, by solving those, those transaction and thread issues. So it's, it makes it like very simple. You don't even know that the threading is an issue. Um, yeah, it didn't put in a funny last slide, I'm sorry. That's, um, that's it. You guys wanna, wanna chat for a minute, uh, some questions? Awesome stuff, Gregor. <laughs> Thanks, really Greg. awesome. Thanks for sharing, man. You had me laughing with the door. Like I'm la I was laughing out loud over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were at a point where you guys, you, you guys, you guys want to want to play with this or use this or extend it. Like, give me a call if like. Like, if you want to add stuff or you want me to add stuff, we can totally do that. Um, I'm, I'm shopping and looking for use cases. I think we can build a lot of cool stuff with this. But uh, we'll, we, need, we need the problems. Otherwise, we'll just build the wrong stuff, you know? Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Hey, cool. I had a quick question about that. Oh, in terms uh -huh. of exactly what you're talking about, like, uh, what's the surface area that you plan to touch? Like, with your path forward in terms of what part of Revit API would it be like uh, to expose it through the GraphQL service? I think the the classic. Um, my camera got confused for a second there. Um, I think the classic traversal problems like MEP, mechanical, electrical. Um, mm -hmm egress and, and routing, like the, the way floors, floors are planned. Um, just, just analytics on, on floor spaces by type and stuff, right? Um, if you want to build, I don't know, a Power BI dashboard on like your floor utilization, it's, it's actually really easy. I mean, I think like what bothers me with Revit is, I, I think like installing plugins is a 
total pain in the ass, right? And, and if we do it right here, and if, if the GraphQL endpoint covers all the stuff you need, you can, you can build a whole ecosystem of stuff against the GraphQL endpoint, it's, and you, you don't need to manage update like uh, plugins, right? I think one thing I need to figure out is how, how, how I can, or how we can like extend the, the GraphQL like functionality and endpoint and like hot load new versions of the DLL without like reinstalling the whole, the whole API and not the whole API, but the whole, the whole plugin. Like at, in, in, in Microdesk, that's one of the issues we have with BIMRx, right? It's a, it's, it's a very, very nice, uh, Revit add-in, like a whole suite of power tools. And every time we want to roll a new version, it's like it's like an eight-week pain in the butt because it needs to get built and tested and QA'd, and then you have a new version. And then the worst part is you need to tell your users to 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 install a Revit, a Revit plugin, you know, which kind of like that's the biggest jump is is, is the last step almost. Other um, other thoughts, other feedback. That's yeah, that's uh, a great. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, that was, I think, the uh, nice seg to my next question. I was gonna ask is, do you see this as more of a power user query sort of uh, endpoint, or do you see it as an endpoint to build applications on? Because I'm in that exact same spot where you said, like, I work with the private plugins, and uh, of course, it needs the whole API to do stuff you want. And looks like this service, if that can do that at a central location outside. And you're yeah. leaning towards that. Like, what's what's in your opinion? What's the end user like? Is I think I think what 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 I've what I've observed the the problem, and maybe I should have a whole page with a disclaimer. Like this graph stuff is like crack. Like you start used to you start doing like Neo4j and and GraphQL, you you'll want to use it everywhere. Um, and we have used it with um, with fabrication stuff, right? So so I was like, I'm not gonna put in a plugin and keep updating my plugin. So I put in a GraphQL endpoint and then. The, the way I interact with the data is through, is through a web page because that's how I can ship it to my users. And, and half my users don't even have Revit, right? That's the other thing. Like the, there's, we need to decouple the, some of these data use cases from, from the Revit operators, right? And I think that we can, we can do that with, with stuff that's like this. That's the approach. That's the approach we took is essentially decouple the schema from Revit and mm -hmm. have the engineers work in the web application and essentially push the data into Revit for schedules and diagrams yeah. and uh, whatever the, the crap that you need yeah, to the do. Other, to the deliver. other thing there, yeah. their excellent point, Arif, the other, other thing is like the, the way you build out this endpoint, Revit might not be your only, your only data store. You might be hooking into, into other databases, other applications, uh, IoT like APIs for overlaying like the, the way you would get like IoT data to show color coding into your Revit model would be through a thing like this, right? And I think Arif had this story earlier, the way they got originally started with GraphQL in, uh, in, in Facebook is very interesting. And it's something that I think we should be doing in our industry a bit more. Is this Shannon like giving me like two minutes? Is this how it works? <laughs> no, you're fine. No, no, so, so let's say like uh, Facebook, right? Mature organization, hundreds of developers. And what they do at Facebook is they build applications for users. They have UI and UX experts. They do A-B testing. They do all this like wonderful work, right? And these guys don't, don't, even, don't even do programming, right? So, but what they do is they basically cook up the application the way they want it on a phone or on a web or, or what have you. And, and they're like, okay, this is what we want to do. We don't even care where the data comes from. This is the GraphQL query we want to run to make this puppy fly. And then they give it to the, to the, to the, to the backend guys and they're like, oh, shit, we need to get into the finance system because they want to pay for something. We need to get into our videos and pictures, and we need to have access to the, to the relationship graph. So it's like the front-end guys job to figure out the front-end stuff for the users, and the GraphQL is Switzerland in the middle. And then the back-end guys basically just, it, it's, it's a, it, it facilitates plumbing, right? And it's something that we don't really do in our industries. Like, when, when, when do you ever, like, hook up the UI with your users, and then you figure out how to build it? It's like... Ben goes off into the land of nerds, you know, he builds something and he was like, oh, I read that. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a backwards way to, to approach uh, building, building user applications. Um, Greg, I'd like to reach out to you about maybe adding subscriptions to that model uh, to have real-time data back 
because I see that you don't have subscriptions. And I think there's a lot of use cases for that where you have two clients connected and the point of subscriptions is, is a WebSocket essentially in GraphQL. Yeah. So you could have clients subscribing to that data and seeing updates in a web page versus you push pulling. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So. No, I, I agree. I agree. What's neat with, um, yeah, maybe that's another one. Like hire people from outside of AEC. Like don't hire like Revit nerds. Hire guys that work at an IoT or at a web startup because um, like I, we work with so much Azure at my old job and we used like IoT Hub and Event Hub and Service Bus and Service Bus is like running on AMQP or whatever it's called. So this whole messaging thing, like other people call it Kafka. It's it's like it's very mature in other other industries, and and we can we can learn a lot from these guys, right? So it's not like where you have to like this, the way this this endpoint that I have here, the way it works is not like I'm not calling like hey, there's something new, there's something new, there's something new. It's it's subscribing to to a topic. It's like it's like Twitter. Like tw the news on Twitter comes to you. Your phone doesn't bombard Twitter with endless requests. There's something new. It's the other way around, right? So that technology is basically what drives the service bus tech, and that's why it's so fast. Other questions, otherwise we'll wrap it.